first of all, delighted to be part of the inaugural in the industry hour, but uh, I was also at the same time upset. I was upset because it's such a good idea. I wish I'd thought about doing this before. It's a great idea and I hope it's very successful. Uh, you know, of course we're all uh, in the Zoom mode, but what I wanna do today is share with you a uh, program that I have done now probably a dozen times around the country, mostly for NECA uh, contractors and or chapters. And uh, it centers around the idea of, of leadership and customer service with a bit of a twist. And I'm gonna tell you this, I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you today and some of it's gonna resonate and some of it may not. And I'd suggest to you because of our, uh, obviously we have limited time, so, we can't go very deep in any of these items, but I would encourage you to do so on your own. And with that, I wanna start with talking a little bit about leadership and 20 years ago, some of you are familiar uh, with uh, myself via the chapter, but about almost now 20 years ago, I was asked to come to Washington to run the National Electrical Benefit Fund and a couple of other plans. And I got some very detailed instruction from my new bosses when I came down here 20 years ago. They said, it's broke, fix it. So what I did was I figured I got to define broke. What does that mean? Well, at any BFR widget, if you will, our product is a timely monthly pension payment to a retiree, right? That's what we do. When I arrived here, it was taken from the day we received your application, it was taken eight months to a year to get you your first payment. That's what you call broken. So I thought, okay, this is low hanging fruit. I'm gonna assemble the leaders of the department. There were four of them, I sat them in a room and I said, tell me why it's taken eight months to a year to produce a pension payment after we received the application. They said, well, you just don't understand. And I said, you're right, I don't understand. Uh, I said, so tell me why it's taken us that long. They said, well, what are you worried about? When we do finally light them up, we give them a retro check back to the first day. I said, guys, this is mom, grandmom and grandpa. This is retirees on fixed income. They need their payments. So one of them finally said to me, well, when would you like us to light up the pension? after we received the application. I said, geez, I don't know. How about this for an idea? How about we light it up the same day we get it? And they all left, Dolly left. So I know it was around St. Valentine's Day. It wasn't on St. Valentine's Day, but it's forever and still remembered as the St. Valentine's Day massacre because we marched the four of them into a room one at a time and we freed them to go work for somebody that would tolerate that. And what we learned there is culture. Culture meant everything. And our culture was very broken. Um, I then proceeded to, a couple of weeks in, I got a, uh, my assistant came to me and she said, there's a contractor, a NECA contractor on the phone and he wants to talk to someone in charge. He wants to talk to you. He said, she said, he's irate, upset with a problem. And I said, really? She said, yeah. She said, but I said, well, give me his number. She said, well, you don't talk to them. I said, excuse me? She said, you don't talk to them. I said, no. I said, this is the customer, the contractor that makes the contribution that gives us the jobs that we have down here. We talked to them, give me the guy's phone number. It was a Friday. Saturday, I'll be driving to the beach at Wildwood. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna wait till tomorrow, Saturday morning and give this guy a call. I call him up, we're talking on the phone. We find out that we have some things in common like the beach and the shore. And he turns out he was a boater. Needless to say, he said, one, I never thought you'd call me back at all. Two, I certainly never thought you'd call me on a Saturday. And it was very purposeful. And I don't know how long we talked. We talked for a long while. But when the conversation was over, I don't remember what his problem was or if he even had one. I know he wanted to be heard. And uh, he said to me, if you're ever in the Wilmington, North Carolina area, look me up. We'll, I'll take you out on the boat. We'll have a couple of drinks. So, and then again, that was deliberate. I reached out then to a friend of mine. Some of you know him. He's been around NECA for a while, uh, Richard Flint. He and I were friends. I said, Richard, I've got a very broken situation here at NEBF. I need to fix it and I need some help. He came in, he studied us for a while. He sat down with me subsequently. He said, all right, he said, it's gonna take you five years and you're gonna lose half your leadership. I said, I don't care who I lose. I don't have five years though. 
So we went to work, rolled up our sleeves, and mainly around developing a culture that cares, care about everything we do, who we do it with, and who we do it for. And that takes time when you're coming out of a culture that didn't give a darn about much of anything but uh, themselves. So fast forward uh, two and a half years later, uh, after we set out to work, I'd lost all but two of 23 leaders, either fired or quit. And again, about two and a half years into the project, the new pension leadership came to me almost giddy one morning saying, hey, we've got great news. I said, what's that? They said, we're, the, the, the pension queue is empty. It said zero. We're waiting for the mail. So what we learned there was culture. What we learned there was accountability. Um, we make it a practice that, and I know you've had this probably in your own experience when someone says they'll call you back and they don't. One of the things we do here, and it's a mortal sin if you don't, you do what you say and you say what you do, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So let me jump into a PowerPoint here. I want to show you a couple of things and talk a little bit more about this concept of uh, leadership. There we go. So let's talk for a second about John Maxwell. I've had the pleasure of not only meeting John Maxwell, but training with him. He says a leader is one that knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way, obviously leading by example. But John Maxwell, believe it or not, has written more on a subject of leadership than anyone in the history of the world. He's I'll say that again. He's written more on the subject of leadership than anyone in the history of the world, yet he defines leadership in a single word despite his writing, that word is influence. And he says there are multiple ways to influence, as does, so I figured if he boils all of his work down to one word, which is influence, and I don't care if it's our relationship with our family or spouse, if it's our work relationships, our customer relationships, every one of us, our IBEW relationships, every one of us is in the business of influencing all the time, all the time. So it's important, I think, to learn as much as one can about that. So I turn to uh, probably the world's, or certainly one of the world's foremost experts in the subject of influence, a guy named Robert Cialdini. He wrote, he co-authored a book called Yes. I would recommend both of these books, by the way. The book's simply called Yes, and the other book, his signature work, is called, believe it or not, Influence. And he talks about uh, he actually talks about weapons of influence. That's how strong a word he uses. But for example, he'll say, and I'm going to share some of these with you, and I would suggest to you as I do, think about how you would employ these in the various areas there you're charged with having influence, i.e. a customer, uh, i.e. your spouse or family, i.e. your uh, IBEW relationships. But one, he says it's about persona. How do you show up? You show up confident. You show up caring. You show up sincere. Because I believe if you show up in those three fashions, there's nothing you can't say to anyone, right? Even if you disagree, and often we do, of course, that's why we're trying to influence in the first place. I mean, this stuff even relates to buying an automobile or buying a home. So it's it's persona. How do I show up confident, caring, and, and, and uh, uh, sincere? I think sincere is critical among them. He also suggests that we can influence with facts, uh, information, statistics, and he calls that the technical side. As contractors, you're very aware of that when you're doing bids or providing information for customers and various aspects of what you propose to do for your customer. That's information, stat, uh, facts, statistics, et cetera. Again, technical side. But the other side that few of us think about is our story. And I mean our individual story as a human being, and perhaps our corporate story, our company story, our CEO's story, we all have a story. And he would suggest to you, if he were here, nothing sells, nothing sells or influences faster or better than a compelling story. He urges his listeners, his readers, to figure out what your compelling story or stories are. People love stories, and they relate to them. So he suggests that. Now, let me get into a few of these weapons, and I want to go through them quickly again because the time, you know, we don't have all the time that, to go through these in any detail. But again, I would suggest you get the book Influence, look at these and apply these, as he says, weapons of 
uh, influence. One is the, uh, and there's only six of them, it's the weapon called reciprocation. If you've been in a Costco market or a supermarket and you've gone up to a stand where they're handing you free stuff, generally food, they are employing the weapon of reciprocation. That freebie, that gift compels a favor in return. So whenever you're giving something away, now think about it as a contractor, you may give away free expertise or free advice, and that ties into one in just a moment. We'll talk about another one. But whenever you do, they did a study. I'll give you an example. They had these people in a study send a bunch of Christmas cards to a bunch of people. I don't remember the numbers. They were huge. Sent a ton of Christmas cards to people they didn't even know to see what would happen. They had over a 90% response rate of people sending cards back to people they did not even know. They based that on this weapon of reciprocation. The next weapon, which I think bodes well for contracting, in, 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 especially electrical contracting, is called the weapon of authority. People want to believe and understand that you are a noted or known authority in what it is you do whether it's specialty contracting or even your general contracting. Uh, for example, fire safety is a big deal. Uh, companies will often go out and offer their expertise in evaluating fire safety in an effort to upsell or sell a system uh, subsequent to that. And again, you go back to reciprocation. If I give you my free expertise, I'm compelling the favor back. So now I'm using reciprocation and authority. The third one is consistency. People want to see you as a corporation, you as a business, uh, you as a service provider, and, and your family, your friends, your, your coworkers, your, your employees. They want to see a consistent human being because I'll just flip it for you this way. You and I all know people that are inconsistent. And what's the first thing you do with inconsistent people is you question whether you should trust them. And trust in a business relationship or in any relationship for that matter is critical. So you want to demonstrate consistency. People look for it and people admire it. The next one, which is universal, by the way, you can use this anywhere and everywhere, and it works well with all the rest. It's called scarcity. Walked into a shop one day having studied this stuff, and there was a dry cleaner, and he had the big carton on the tape on the care of those things you roll to get the lint off of your clothing. And it was full, there was 12 of them and it was full. I said, what you need to do, I said, is take all but two of them out of there. Let people believe that these things are flying off the shelf and they're gonna become scarce. But you understand the concept of scarcity. Anytime you say to someone, you know, it's a limited time offer, or it's a limited availability, people kind of wanna jump on it. I mean, Bitcoin, look at what happened with that. But uh, so scarcity, is one where you're saying you're, you're limiting availability, you're limiting access. And, and again, it could work in all. Don't just think in terms of business. Think in terms of uh, your own personal relationships, your employees, those people that you're charged with uh, leading. The next, the fifth principle is called liking. And whether you like it or not, it's important to be likable. Uh, and it doesn't have to be always with everyone, but People want to do business, and I'm sure all of you that are contractors on this call would attest, uh, people do business with you. Generally, they're people you like. It's, it, it's often more than just a business relationship. There's a social relationship, perhaps, or friendship even, because people tend to do business with people that are like them because they like them. So liking is the principle. And then finally, the sixth principle is called social proof. People want to know what everyone else is doing. So, for example, if you're a contractor and you have a specialty, let's say it's hospitals or fire uh, alarm work or what, whatever, low voltage work, whatever that specialty may be, obviously from the earlier one, you want to establish that you're the authority. You probably want to give some free advice away. But on social proof, people want to know who else is doing business with you and they want to know that others are. And it's important that for example, if I were trying to convince a client that I'm an expert in XYZ application electrical, whether it's hospital, fire alarm, low, whatever it is, you all know it better than I do, uh, I would like to hear from other people that you work with that are like me, that I am administrator of a hospital and I'm considering you for work, whether whatever work, 
I would like to hear from people that are like me or similarly situated because you enhance the compliance rate uh, of people working with you when you do that. So those are the six principles, reciprocation, authority, consistency, scarcity, liking, and social proof. Let me give you two uh, bonuses, and these are cool because I happen to love them, uh, and I use them all the time. Um, there were major studies done, and Cialdini talks about it in his book. Uh, he says, what single word can you inject into your conversation that'll skyrocket the compliance when you're asking for something? That single word is the word because. He said, generally, there's a 60% compliance on average in a general uh, sense of people complying with requests from other people, 60%. In these massive tests, they said when they added the word because to the request, anywhere in the request, the compliance rate went up to 94%, from 60% to 94%, just because you use the word because. Why? Because the word itself, and it doesn't matter what follows the word in your request, the word because implies there's a reason that I'm asking you to do this. And you and I, all of us want to know there's a reason to do something. We don't just do because we're told or asked. We do because there's a reason I should be doing this. And it skyrockets your compliance. Secondly, he talks about second bonus and I'll get off it. He talks about what single uh, piece of stationery could skyrocket or greatly enhance compliance with a request from you to another. And that is, say, for example, you're giving someone a file, a bid, uh, a, a document, or uh, just, just use a document for now, that you need some action on that document. Believe it or not, taking a stick note, putting it on the cover of that file or that bid or that whatever, and writing a personal note, Thank you for considering this. Thank you for reviewing this. Thank you for taking care of this, Larry. Skyrockets the compliance, just the fact and the implication of that is that you've taken, even though it didn't take much time, you've taken time to uh, actually uh, write a physical hand, handwritten note on, on top of that uh, file or that bid or whatever it is. Here's another guy, and I don't know him, I've not met him, but you know him is Sir Richard Branson, and I don't know about his personal life, uh, good or bad, up or down, but I do know that if you measured him financially, you'd say he's done a few things right. And he's an interesting guy, and I studied him, and here's what I've taken from him. He always seeks first to understand before he tries to impose himself as powerful a person as he can be, he always seeks to understand first might sound like Seven Habits uh, book from a few years back. He says leaders are leaders. His model, by the way, for learning was simply this. And he'll tell you this because I've read this about him. He said, what I did was I just, he said, I ventured into all different kinds of businesses, ideas, concepts. He said, the first thing I would do always is learn as much as I could about the thing that I'm dealing with, the idea, the business or whatever, learn as much as I could. And just as fast, I would delegate it. So I take it in, learn it, understand it, and delegate it. Seek to understand first, then delegate it out. He said, so I knew what they were doing, but I wasn't doing it, and I was learning a ton in the process. Makes a lot of sense. And finally, he says, and I think this is critical and often overlooked, that laughter is medicine. And I, I would tell you I could do a couple of hours on that subject right there. If you ever look up a guy named Norman Cousins, a doctor, he could uh, he probably wrote the book on laughter being healing, and it's legitimately very, very real. Let me uh, so here's the takeaways for customer relationships that I have learned. Greet with high energy, and I have a principle uh, that I try to apply, and I hopefully I'm applying it right now. Highest energy always wins. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt said, walk as if you have somewhere to go, even if you don't. In other words, again, back to Cialdini, how do you show up? Show up with high energy. Let people know you're excited and you've got some passion. Let them tell you what they want. Listen, seek to understand, do not interrupt, right? I'm trying to now to distill the process. Stay patient as much as you want to. A lot of us will listen to respond, not listen to understand. Stay patient and really try to understand the problem. And I'm going to relate this to stuff I did with contractors. 
tell them you want to help them. I'm here to help you. That gentleman I called on Saturday morning, the woman I called in North Florida on eight o'clock at night because I knew the kids would be in bed and she was hitting her head on health care issues. Uh, I'm here to help you. It doesn't mean I'm here to give you whatever you want, but I'm going to do my damnedest to solve your problem or help you with your problem and ask questions to chunk it down as a specific issue. Now I'm going to go back and talk about contractors as I used to uh, service contractors and, and relate with them. And typically this would fall in the labor relations realm where a contractor would show up at my office or show up on my phone saying, you know, the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, this union's out of control, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, well, let's get specific. Tell me specifically what's going on with local one, two, three, or whatever the local is, or, or business manager, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe. Tell me what's going on. You chunk it down. I'm asking questions to find out, no, the world really isn't ending. Tell me what's really going on. And I find out that, well, damn it, they promised me, you know, X number of apprentices on this job, and I'm still waiting still losing my rear end here. You have to then determine, can you solve the issue? Do you need additional resources? An example I'm giving you, and let's use that example. So a contractor comes to me, wants to file a grievance because he's not getting the apprentices. I, of course, I'm gonna try to talk him off the ledge and I do need somebody else. I need that business manager. I get on the phone. Again, hopefully it's relational. I get on the phone with that business and it wasn't always, <laughs> it wasn't always, but you try to make it so. Uh, I get on the phone with that business manager to say, uh, I need some help here. And I used to tell my wife, I'd leave the house in the morning with deuces. And I know that business manager's got aces and I got to win a hand or two because I'm representing people that are paying me to do so, right? That's you, the contractor. So I would talk to that. And, and this is where I learned what I call the wimpy. Remember Popeye, the cartoon? Remember wimpy? What did wimpy always say? He said, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. So I could get in the ring and start duking it out with that business manager, but you and I know that, and sometimes you need to do that, but so, but generally when you do, everybody gets blood on and it usually doesn't work out well. So I can get private with that business manager. Again, if I'm, if I'm confident, I'm sincere, I'm caring in my relationship, I go to him or her and say, listen, my contractor needs help. There's more than one way to skin a cat. We can employ the, the wimpy three. Larry, that job's political. The, the chief shop steward's running against me. Whatever the story is, I, I, I can't give that one up. Well, then I need to reward this contractor and make this contractor whole. Well, can I give him a hamburger, a Pam Tuesday for the hamburger today, the wimpy theory? And oftentimes, not always, oftentimes that would work out. What I'm suggesting is flexibility in the approach. And it isn't always linear. You know, to solve the problem doesn't always mean you get what you want or he or she gets what they want. It may be a third realm. And then finally, do what you say and say what you do. Nothing annoys me more. And it happens a lot to me, and I'm sure it does to you. When someone says they will do something or they will call you by the end of the day or this or that, and they don't. I can tell you at NEBF, and we're not perfect by any stretch, but that's a mortal sin here. You tell people you're going to do something, you do what you say, and you say what you're going to do. It's critical, because here's the critical question. Everybody in your world, from your family to your customers to your employees, is saying this. Can I count on you? Can I count on you? Again, back to the weapons of, of, of uh, uh, influence. Are you consistent? Do people know what they're getting? One of my biggest goals as, a, as an administrator, as an executive of these funds down here is that I'm seen as one who is consistent. If I say something, I do it. It doesn't mean you're always getting what you want, but I'm going to do my best. I always tell people we'll bend the rules, bend the crap out of the rules. We just can't break the rules, right? And here's a simple rule that we strive for, too. Again, this is back to culture. Rather than do the least possible, which is what I found when I got here, just barely enough to get from being fired. We've shifted the culture because culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Culture in your organization, in your world is way more important than any strategy or plan you have because your plan will fail without the right culture. We always strive to give people more than what they expected to get. Under promise and over deliver. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and ask you to think about this question, who is your most important customer? You might be thinking XYZ manufacturing company. 
the administrator at that hospital you do a lot of work for. Uh, you could be thinking about a lot of, some people have said to me, live classes, they said my spouse, you know, who's your most important customer? Well, for today, I wanna have you think about it this way. How about we call it you? You are your most important customer just for today's conversations, okay? So I'm gonna ask you not the cliche, how do you see your glass? Because some people certainly see it half empty. Some people see it empty completely, but that's not where I'm going with this. I'm asking you, or is it running over? Because here's the bottom line. You can't pour from an empty glass. Remember earlier on, we talked about showing up. If you're showing up to, and I'll tell you, as a chapter manager, I remember a president of ours at Pendell, Jersey, called me one day and said, you know, you sound like Eeyore. You sound like you're always bummed out and depressed. And I, I did. I wasn't even realizing it. You know what I said that day? I said, he will never say that to me again. He will never say those words to me again. And I realized my energy, who I am when I show up is up to me. And I know this, I can't help you or anyone else unless I'm full and running over and taking care of me, right? That's what's critical here. So the best thing you can do for the whole world is to make the most of yourself. The best you can do for yourself, the best you can do for your family, your loved ones, the best you can do for your employees, your customers is make the most of yourself. So what we say, I'm not preaching. I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. Have to get you right first. Have to get me right first. That comes down to health and fitness, our relationships, our finances, our business, our work, our career. All that stuff needs to be taken care of. But without you being able to pour from a full overflowing cup, it's going to be very difficult to take care of these things. So I'm going to give you some uh, pointers. I'm asking these questions simply uh, for some reflection. What makes you and me tick? Think about it. What is success to you? Your business people, have you ever sat down with your favorite beverage in a quiet spot and just analyze that question? What does success look like for Bradley Electric? What does success look like for this guy named Larry Bradley? or any of you? Have you ever pondered it? I have. And I say, is it health? Well, of course, without it, we don't have much else. Is it happiness? Yes. Is that a choice? I happen to believe so. Is it wealth? It could be. It could be. Right? But then look what they say about those lottery winners, like three quarters of them end up broke and destitute. And one just woke up the other day, a billionaire in Michigan, I believe. Sorry, that wasn't me. Peace of mind. This is a big one for me because I got an overactive mind. My, my brain's running all the time. And, you know, sometimes I have trouble sleeping because I got so much going on. We'll talk about that in a minute. But ego, is it becoming famous? Maybe, maybe not. Because look what happened there. So, again, I talk about self-reflection. It, it, what really matters it doesn't matter what I think is success for you. I think the only thing that really matters is what is success to you? What does it mean to you? And I think it's worth reflecting. But for today, I'd like to say or suggest that we play with this as the answer. Getting the positive outcomes that you desire. So once you've sat down and said, what is success? And you start to define it, you put skin and meat on the bones of the spine of that question, what is success? What really is it? Definitively, what is it? Put meat on the bones. So that what we do or fail to do, all of our behavior, all of our behavior, uh, people tend to think it's logical. It's not. Uh, behavior actually uh, is driven by feelings. Have you ever said to yourself, I can't believe I did that. I know better. I knew better. Well, that's logic talking. Logic doesn't win the day. It's always feelings. Here's how it works. So we start with programming. And that could start as a young child that some would even argue that starts within the womb. Some would say it started prior generations. We won't go there. Let's just say it starts when we're born and we start be getting inputs to our senses. And it's mainly family, loved ones, and then friends, and then teachers, and then, you know, ourselves ultimately about the age of reason, we start to program ourselves. Those programs create in us a set of beliefs that we carry through this world with us. Those beliefs generate our attitude about the world around us. I'm gonna give you a couple, two examples of this. And then ultimately 
Programming beliefs and attitudes generate feelings. Now, if you ever had somebody say, hey, you want to go to the mall? I feel like shopping. And you might say, no, nah, I don't feel like it. You often hear that word feel because that precedes behavior or, or failure to behave. I don't feel like it. I feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing that. You could talk logic to your blue in the face. It's not what drives our behavior. And it's not what gives us or deprives us of the outcomes that we seek, those success definitions, if you will. So all of this ultimately equals behavior. So I'm going to give you an example. You sit at the kitchen table from the time you're a young child up and, and dad or mom or both are preaching uh, from the dinner table. You know, we're working class poor people in this family, always have been. Oh, there's the program. Thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. That's great. That'll serve me well when I get older. That creates a belief that we're always going to be broke. I'm a person that's going to believe, well, if we've been working class poor people for generations, I guess I'm going to stay broke becomes my belief. So my attitude then becomes, well, I can't change it. So why bother? My feeling is then helpless as, as it relates to money or success. It's helpless because I was destined to be this way. At least that's what my programming says. And then the behavior becomes minimal effort. No, no striving for education, no striving to start a business or get a great job. It's just, hey, I was meant to be poor. Let me give you another example. You sit at the, uh, again, you, you know, you could have all the kids sitting around the table with little wires stuck in their ear, and mom and dad are the motherboard doing the programming of those little minds saying something like, you know, we're big boned in this family. We're always, always been heavy people. We've got big bones. Uh, that generates a belief that says, well, I guess I'm always going to be overweight, I'm always going to be a big, big guy. Attitude is, doesn't matter what I do, feeling becomes helpless again. I'm destined to be big, so I'm always going to be overweight. What happens? Behavior, I'm going to eat a lousy diet, and most likely I'm not going to exercise. See how that process works? And I'd ask you when you have contemplative time, I, I'm big on contemplating you know, me with myself, you with yourself. I always say to people, get your favorite beverage, sit back in a nice, quiet, easy chair, and really think about these things because it matters. Think about how this plays in your life because people will argue with you that logic controls behavior. I would argue with you based on my experience and, and understanding, it never does. It's always feelings. So speaking of diet, there's also your media diet. What are you feeding your mind? Now, you remember when we were kids, when I was a kid, there was three channels. In Philadelphia, it was three, six, and 10, maybe 29 and 17, but you never did with UHF or something. But, you know, your media was limited. Today, you're on a 24-7 news cycle or whatever you want to call it, cycle. And then you've got all the social media stuff bombarding our minds. I mean, you sit around and you look at people, you know, glued to their device 24-7, I say, say, sitting in a living room with the people you care about the most, talking to someone that isn't even in the living room through, through, through the device. So you want to be mindful of the media, uh, uh, your media diet. Henry Thoreau said this, and I believe it. And this is another contemplative. I don't mean to be over contemplative, but it's about us. It's about you and me. It's about succeeding. It's about living a life we want to live. That's what this is really about. And how do we get ourselves there? Most men, I say most people, this was Thoreau, he said this a long time ago, live lives of quiet desperation and go to their graves with their music still in them. Someone said to me recently, and I believe it, there are people in the graveyard that would make Sinatra sound like a biker, but they never had the courage. Never had the courage. So what are we doing now? You look at the COVID situation, which has amplified everything I'm about to say to you, but people are living quietly desperate full of regret, full of negative emotions, overwhelmed, especially right now. I could give you the stats on, on the, uh, the depressions up 17%. Now, 27% of Americans diagnosed as depressed. Thank you, COVID. That's 90 million Americans depressed, overwhelmed, dealing with stress. So let me talk about stress for a minute. Centers for Disease Control says this, stress is now the number one delivery system for disease in America. Stress is now the number one delivery system for disease in America. How does it work? You become stressed, you know, if you have acute stress like exercise, that's good for us. That's good for us, it's good for our body. Uh, but if you have chronic stress, a bad job, a bad relationship, 
a bad boss, a bad customer, a bad whatever. Uh, it's taking its toll and what it does, it inflames the body with inflammation, with through the cortisol and epinephrine, norepinephrine hormones that are created when we're under stress, chronic stress. And that stress is creating inflammation and to put it simple, inflammation in a human body is like the red carpet laid out to say the disease, come on in, you're welcome. The goal that I have, we have, is to become the least welcoming host for disease that we can possibly be. Dr. Deepak Chopra, some of you may know him, renowned medical doctor and practitioner of Ayurveda, Ayurvedic medicine, the oldest medicine on earth, 5,000 years old. Dr. Chopra says this, that 95% of all disease is undigested anger. Dr. Bruce Lipton in his book, The Biology of Belief, and I would highly recommend it. He says there are three things that cause disease in a human being, three things only. They are trauma, and don't just think physical trauma, think mental, emotional trauma, childhood trauma. Toxins in our food, air, and our environment obviously make sense, right? And here's the other one. The third T is thought, thought creates illness. Thoughts become things. Thoughts are energy. And we've got people that are living in regret, full of negative emotion, overwhelmed. And those emotions are anger, fear, and guilt, the primary ones. There's plenty of them, but anger, fear, and guilt are those. So here's the, the lesson. The lesson of this is that uh, oh, and by the way, Dr. Bruce Lipton says he, he betters Dr. Chopra. He says 99% of disease is unresolved emotions, negative emotions in the human state. That's pretty wild. So here's the lesson. And this is, if you have any takeaway for today, take this away. And know this as you contemplate this going forward, and I hope you do. Unresolved emotions cannot die. Unresolved emotions cannot die. So the goal is to become the most unwelcoming host. So let's talk about anger as the first one. The idea here is to take everything to a logical conclusion. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to be anger-free, fear-free, or guilt-free. It just means you're going to minimize these things in your life and lessen the impact that they're having by creating the inflammation and ultimately disease. Because an inflamed mind, by the way, is an inflamed body. There's no difference. So we want to learn to take everything to a logical conclusion. So let's talk about anger. What is it? Strong feeling of annoyance or displeasure. So what makes us angry? Here's what we believe makes us angry. People, my brother-in-law, and things, circumstances, traffic jams, right? People and things, circumstances. That's what makes us angry, or that's what we believe makes us angry, or we interpret it as anger. So let me talk to you about my brother-in-law for a minute. I haven't had a hamburger on his barbecue grill for probably 30 years. I don't even know if he still owns a barbecue grill, and I tell my wife all the time, I hate him. She says, I wish you wouldn't use that word. That's too strong. Don't use that word, hate. I said, all right, I'll quit using the word hate as long as you understand I hate him. Well, I'm Irish. And sometimes we do stuff for sport, right? So I realized because I learned these things, I'm dealing with this brother-in-law. And my wife would say to me, well, don't tell me, tell him. I said, no, that would ruin it. That would end it. And the, and the game, the sport would be over is what I'm thinking in my crazy mind, right? So but what happens when we stay in anger, whether it's traffic jams or your brother-in-law or whatever it is, or your customer, you're mixing and consuming a chemical cocktail in your gut. Your gut, by the way, which is 80 to 90% of your immune system, you're retaining a chemical cocktail that is literally toxic and killing you and me from the inside out. Uh, I'll give you proof. If you don't think your mind can influence your body, um, the chemical composition of tears when we cry, the chemical composition of tears, whether they're tears of joy or tears of anger or sadness, the chemical composition changes to become more toxic with the emotion associated to the tears. That's how powerful our mind is in speaking to the body. So what do you do with anger? Les Brown, who I also trained with uh, pretty extensively, used to talk about an 80-20 rule with anger. He said 80% of the people that you're mad at don't even know you're mad. So while you're killing yourself with that chemical cocktail, they're out at the beach or having a picnic or at the 
you know, at the show, whatever, having a good old time. And the other 20%, they're glad they got you angry. It's kind of this sport thing I was talking about before. So I'm going to give you a formula real quick for these emotions, and it applies to the three I'm going to talk about, anger, fear, and guilt. First of all, anger. First thing you do is acknowledge it. I'm angry at my brother-in-law. Let's just use that as an example, or at least I thought I was. So you acknowledge it. Yeah, I have this anger thing with him. Yes. All right. Validate it. Next is validate it. How do you validate it? Well, you ask, is it real? I mean, do I really hate my brother-in-law? And it occurred to me when I went through this process of validation, I don't really hate him because the truth is, if I never see him again, it wouldn't matter. He doesn't matter in my life. So I guess it was just sport, the anger, but it was killing me, not him. He didn't even know because I wouldn't tell him, I'd tell my wife. So I, I, what I did was in the validation process, I realized uh, I'm not really angry at him. He doesn't matter to me. And I often tell people this, that people think the opposite of love is hate. It's not. The opposite of love is apathy. You check out, you stop caring. I'll give you an example of that too. My kids all played sports in school. And Jay, you could relate to this. They complain to mom and dad, man, the coach is really on my case, you know, screaming, yelling at me all the time. I don't like basketball. I don't like this. I tell them all the time, listen, you should be excited that coach is yelling at you because you know what? He's invested. Emotion is investment. If you're if you're angry with someone genuinely or if you have an issue with someone, that means you're invested in that someone because if you weren't, you'd be apathetic. You wouldn't care. It wouldn't matter. Finally, you address it. And with my brother-in-law, my addressing it was just simply to say, I'm dismissing this because it's not valid. It was just stupid on my part. I thought it was fun sport, but it was hurting me. I dismiss it because I don't really hate him, right? He just doesn't matter to me in my life. And that's sad, but it's true. He's on my wife's side, by the way, just saying. So you address it. But let's say it's somebody that you really are angry with. That means you have an investment in that relationship. That means, again, going back to the beginning, if you're, if you're sincere and, and, and you're caring, I believe there's no conversation you cannot have. And you may first have that conversation in your mind and decide to let that anger go, but it would always be helpful, too, in a loving, caring way to go to that person and have a conversation say, look, I care about you, but I'm angry about something or something's making me upset. Can we talk about it? I bet if you approach it properly, there's nothing you can't approach or deal with. So taking it to a, lock, a logical conclusion, and I'll say this to you too, it is critically important to forgive. It's critically important to seek forgiveness, right? And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Let's talk about the next one. It's called fear. Unpleasant emotion caused by a belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. I'll make a confession right now that as the chapter manager of Pendell, Jersey, many, many years ago, I'll tell you the year, I was just about to become the manager. I wasn't yet. I was the assistant. It was 1984, NICA convention, New Orleans, Louisiana, October. Nancy and I are on a plane from Philadelphia to New Orleans, and a sudden storm came up off the Gulf as we were approaching uh, New Orleans. And the captain got on the loudspeaker and said, we're going in. We would later find out, thank God, we were the last plane to land that afternoon. All the other planes were diverted from New Orleans over to Houston because that weather was so severe. Nancy and I did all but say goodbye to one another on that airplane that day. 1984, we were there over Halloween. You ever ever want a, a, a one and done good time? Do Halloween on Bourbon Street. That's a, that's a treat. But in any event, I got off that plane that day and I announced to my wife, I am never flying again. I'm driving home or taking the train. So my directors didn't know this at Pendell, but for quite a while, I was taking trains and cars to, I went to convention in Las Vegas the following year by train from Philadelphia. That's two and a half days each way prior to cell phones. So I was like, where's Waldo? Larry's lost. Where is he? Two and a half days on a train both ways. My wife begged me. So I said, I got to get over this. I was prepared to go in to the board of directors at Pendell Jersey and resign my position because I knew it couldn't be tolerated that I was doing this. And I just felt bad about it. And then a guy named Ron Smallwood kind of got in the way and he, he talked to me about it and said, listen, he said, if I go down on the plane, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one that's going to walk away. So sit close to me, right? Just that was kind of guy he was, but 
Uh, Ron coached me and worked me. Because he, he, here's what I learned. I learned if you're afraid of something, you fear something, you study it. I learned that you seek out experts. In my case, I studied flying, literally looked at what happens when an airplane flies. I spoke to pilots. I spoke to people that worked in the, the uh, uh, what do you call that, the, the traffic control. Uh, I subsequently learned the fact that you're safer in the air than you are on the ground. I'm safer in a plane than I am in my car. And then having a guy like Ron Smallwood egging me on saying, look, we got a bunch of short trips to Pittsburgh. It's 40 minutes in the air. Let's crawl before we walk, before we run again. And slowly but surely, and with a great help from Anthony Robbins, teaching about fear and how to address it. Susan Jaffe wrote a book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Her prescription was if you step into the thing that you fear and embrace it, the death of that fear is certain. The death of that fear is certain. So slowly but surely, I start today. I'm uh, executive platinum on American Airlines, and I'll fly anywhere and anything. Again, what was the formula? I acknowledged the fear, right? I validated it. It was real. Now, there are fears that don't matter to us, too. For example, again, with flying, I have an absolute fear of jumping out of perfectly good airplanes for sport. But I also don't have any intention of ever doing it. So the fear doesn't own me. It doesn't matter to me. You kind of checked out on that. And then I addressed it. I, I learned some things. I talked to experts. I talked to people that didn't have the fear. And tell me why you don't fear this. Help me understand your psychology, your philosophy. And that was extremely helpful to me. And then finally, let's move on to guilt. And guilt is the, fear, uh, the fact of having committed a specified or implied offense. Two types of guilt, two types. Now, these are the primary, and this is the last one, negative emotions. There are other emotions that are subsets of this, but the formula, acknowledge, validate, and address it, applies to any and every negative emotion you could experience. I'm just using the three major ones because these are heavy, uh, especially this one, guilt, because it's so destructive, it's so powerful, and it's so eternal if you let it be. I had a case where I had done some wrong to someone many, many years ago, decades ago, and I pleaded for that person to forgive me I said I was sorry. I was genuinely sorry. I said if I knew better, I would have done better. I promise you, I am sorry. Absolutely wouldn't forgive me, would not forgive me. So, and this was outer impose because there's two types, right? There's self imposed guilt. I feel bad because I think I did or didn't do something to someone. And then there's outer impose. This other person outside of you makes you feel guilty over something you did or they thought you did or didn't do, failed to do. And in this case, in my story, it was uh, something that I did, uh, and then the guilt was out imposed upon me by her. Would not forgive me, and finally I decided one night, I said, I, someone asked me this question uh, to ask that person. You know I'm sorry. I've asked for your forgiveness many times. Here's the question. It was powerful. How long would you like me to feel like this? Just how long would you like me to feel like this because you will not forgive me? And I get it. She didn't forgive me, but guess what I did? I went to the bathroom, I looked in the mirror, and I forgave myself, and I let it go. So I acknowledged it. It was real. I validated it. It was very real. I did commit the offense. It wasn't that egregious, but it was to her. And then I addressed it. I said I tried to uh, uh, have a conversation in sincerity and caring. I tried to seek forgiveness. It wasn't happening. So I decided to forgive myself. Forgiveness, I want to tell you, whether you're getting it or giving it, is a supreme act of selfishness. You don't forgive for them. You forgive for you. Because just like anger, just like fear, guilt will create that chemical cocktail that kills us, literally kills us from the inside out. And again, I believe any conversation can be had with anyone that you have equity in no matter what the emotions are, anger, fear, or guilt, or whatever, if you're sincere and caring, you could say anything to anyone you want. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever had this happen? You're lying in bed at night trying to get some sleep, and all of a sudden, this booming voice comes down and says, hey, Larry, I see you're trying to get some rest. This is your brain speaking. I think what I will do for you is play a continuous loop audio video of the dumbest crap you've done your entire life. And you lie awake thinking about it. 
everything on this earth is energy, including those thoughts, including everything I've spoken to now. Everything you can see, touch, feel, smell, taste, everything on this earth is energy, including these emotions. And I talked about fear, anger, and guilt. They resonate on an energy level of about 30 to 50 cycles, 30 to 50 cycles. Here's the powerful trinity, love, forgiveness, and gratitude. If you can convince yourself daily to think about who you love and express it, if you can seek or provide forgiveness to someone, even if you don't want to, knowing how toxic it is on you, and if you can be in gratitude of the things that you have, these three emotions are the most powerful emotions on earth. And these three emotions resonate anywhere from 700 to 1,000 cycles versus 30 to 50. So imagine, I call it love, forgiveness, and gratitude taking on fear, anger, and guilt is like hitting a mosquito with a sledgehammer. And you're calming this gut of ours down. So I'm going to suggest for you a new brand called WOW. I don't know if you ever heard of Gary Vinderchuk, but Gary is a uh, guy, he's now the big wine uh, guy. He's a multimillionaire from North Jersey. He's an immigrant, I worked with his dad in a liquor store, packaged good in North Jersey. And I was at a seminar where they had all week long, all these giants in the industry speak. Anthony Robbins got up and talked about the 12 secrets to succeeding in life. And Dennis Waitley got up and the seven, uh, primary ways to, you know, reach your goal. And everybody had formulas and formulas all week long. And then they got to this guy as the last speaker of the day on Friday. And they said, listen, if you don't like foul language, it might be a good time to take a break because our next speaker has no filter. His name is Gary Vanderchuk. And Gary Vanderchuk got up there all week long. You had these great giants of the industry speaking. This guy gets up there and he says, you want an expletive seminar? I'll give you an expletive seminar. In one word, he said, expletive care. Care about yourself. Care about what you do. Care about your love balls. Care about who you do it with. Care, just care. Expletive care. And he dropped the mic and walked off. Who do you think was the most memorable speaker of the conference? was Gary Vanderchuk. So I say, wake up and crush it. That's what he's written a book called Crush It. So care and crush it. There's the formula. Or as Mark Wahlberg said, lone survivor, anything in life worth doing is worth overdoing. Mediocrity is for cowards. Or I love this. Mickey Rourke and the wrestler. Since when did average win a goddamn prize? Right? When I Google search things, I always put the word extreme in front of whatever I'm searching because I don't want to know what normal, regular, average people are doing. I don't care what they're doing. I want to know what the extremists are doing, you know, the stretch thinkers. I don't want to know what average people are doing. So I say the formula is to care about everything that's in your life and everything that you do. Crush it, meaning don't just show up, crush it, and that equals wow. The wow factor. How I get there real quickly. This is the most powerful thing I've learned in my life on the planet. And it was taught to me by Anthony Robbins. I heard it about 2,000 times before I actually heard it for the first time. And that is that your past is not equal to the future. The bottom line is right up to these words coming out of my mouth. That's my past. It doesn't matter relative to my future. I determine my future. Focus on what you want, not what you don't want. Most people, I listen to people talk about their diseases, and they always preface with my diabetes, my cancer, my, my, my. No, it's not mine. We don't own it. We don't own it. It's an unwelcome intruder. Don't own it. Focus on what you want, not what you don't. You want a disease for state. You want a happy, healthy, wealthy life. Whatever it is that you decide is success for you, Focus on that and only that. Most of us focus on what we lack, not what we want or not what we have, unfortunately. And you are way more powerful than you think you are. I had a powerful seminar the other day and it said, what you can accomplish in an hour. 
And I, I implemented this thing and I was blown away at myself at what I could do in just one hour of my time with focused energy. It's mind blowing. And it teaches you one thing. We're so much more powerful than we ever think we are. Mind over body. We talked about it already with the chemical cocktail in our gut based on simply what we're thinking and emotions. But have you ever been embarrassed? That's a physiological reaction to a thought, right? And then the body over the mind. How do you carry yourself? Again, how do you show up? Take control of your state. It affects everything in an instant. When I listen to Les Brown, he said when he get a speaking engagement, especially early on, he'd ask the host, where's the bathroom? He'd go in the bathroom. He said he'd start pacing. Then he'd start deep breathing. He looked like a nut in the bathroom, but he didn't care. He'd start pacing. Then he'd start deep breathing. Then he'd start talking to himself and get emotional saying, I'm going to burn this place down today with my message. I'm going to affect a ton of people. I'm going to affect a ton of lives. He made a decision, right? And your destiny, as Anthony Robbins likes to say, is shaped in your moments of your decisions. So here's your assignment. The time is now. Starts with wowing yourself. Remember the glass overflowing? Because you can't pour what you don't have. You got to first take care of you. Wow yourself. And how about we wow ourselves if we have one? Our boss, our friends, our coworkers, our family, our customers. Don't just show up. Wow them. Wow them. And be sincere. Be genuine. You can't just show up one day being kind of crazy, right? You work your way to. I haven't always been presenting myself like this. I learned and I developed it because I know that it matters for me. And I bring this guy, this person you're seeing and hearing now to everything I do in my life because of what I've been able to learn from this. Yes, even when you're having a bad hair day, back to Rich Flint when I brought him in here, he would tell me, you know, so-and-so has quite a few bad hair days. I said, yeah, I get that. You know, one of our leaders, he said, let me tell you something, here's a rule. He said, everybody can have a bad hair day now and again, three in a row is an agenda. You got to deal with that. And that's what we did. So finally, I'll say, take action on your relationships, your schooling, if you need further schooling, your business, your job. As you contemplate your personal changes, whether it's health and fitness, uh, as you contemplate what success means to you with that beverage in your nice easy chair, answer those questions, understand how to relax those emotions and deal and address with them, those emotions in your life. It'll set you up on a runway to deal with this stuff your future. I appreciate the time with you today. I know we went a few minutes over and had a little bit of technical difficulty. Here's my hope and my prayer. I hope that um, I've touched you in some way that makes a difference for you and that uh, I'll, I'll leave you with what uh, I saw uh, Stephen Covey speak one time about the seven habits of highly successful people. And Stephen Covey, always I would learn, ended his presentations with, teach what you learn before the sun sets today. Even if you speak to furniture or a pet or a family member, teach what you learn, you'll retain it better. If I can help any of you in any way, shape, or form beyond today with any of this stuff, I am perfectly available because I love it. I'm passionate about it, and I only know that because of what it's done for me and the people that I love and care about. So thank you. If Jay, if there's time, I'd be glad to have any questions or whatever. Sure, uh, Larry. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, for Larry, you do have the ability to uh, unmute yourself and kindly ask. Uh, just ask. We have try and keep it a little bit under control, and, or you're more than welcome to enter a question into the chat box, and I'd be more than happy to ask that question to Larry. And Larry, I think I have a question I'd like to kick it off with. In your opinion, what, what is the best way to implement those six principles of leadership in your everyday life? Is it just through your everyday interactions or what have you found works best to help you start to implement these, um, I'll call them guidelines or rules or? Right, so, so the six, uh, uh, Cialdini, six weapons, actually there's more than six, but uh, what I did was this, I broke it down. So I take, I where in my life am I exercising influence and with whom am I doing it? So obviously my wife comes into that mix. Uh, my work here comes into that mix with the trustees. Uh, I work with IBEW folks. I work with DECA folks. Uh, I, I assess one at a time, so break it down. What influence am I trying to exert? 
And then I look at the six principles. I, I keep a list of those and I try to apply them. How can I apply this principle consistency to my trustees? And it's real simple. I'm, I'm picking low hanging fruit here. Uh, my bosses want to see this guy being very consistent in his application and his exercise of the rules and regulations and my relationship with and to them, how I report to them, how I communicate with them, how I, when and how I contact them over what kinds of things. So I take the literal list and the subject of my influence, whatever, whoever that is, and I look at it like thoughtfully look at it and say, how can I apply this one to this and then this one? And sometimes they don't all apply. But sometimes they will. Sometimes you'll see them crossover, and it's really kind of cool to see that. But I'm always mindful of these things, and it's not the key thing to keep in mind here is not to do these in a manipulative fashion, fashion because this stuff is powerful. It works. It works unbelievably well. So it's not obviously for uh, uh, wrongful gain, if you will. Larry, I am seeing a uh, a lot of thank yous in the chat window. Uh, Many have said this is the, the great way to start their week. And thank you very much for your time. Does anyone else have any other questions uh, for Larry? Larry, on behalf of the, the, the members and staff of the Pendel Jersey chapter, I can't thank you enough. I couldn't think of a better leadoff batter to kick off this industry hour series. Uh, I know how busy you are. I look forward to hearing you later on this week at the IBW and NECA Benefits Conference. Uh, for everyone else on the call, uh, there will be a survey being sent out directly after the call. Please give us your feedback. We do want to make sure we are um, presenting the best um, materials for, for what the membership is looking for. Really appreciate if you just took a few moments. It'll take less than a minute to fill that out. And Larry, personally, uh, always a pleasure to hear and see from you, my friend. I can't thank you enough for being involved with the Industry Hour. Thank you for having me. It's my honor to have helped kick this off. And I, I want to reiterate, uh, I'm available to anyone that's heard this message sincerely uh, uh, to further the ideas or help in any way. With If you're like me, your best question will be six o'clock tonight, you know, when you're having your dinner. So I'm open and available. And the folks, a lot of folks on this phone know me. But if you don't, please go through Jay and uh, I'd be happy to walk, talk and walk with you. And there's no no money involved here. I just, I'm passionate about this stuff. I believe in the message messages. So if I can help in any way, please don't hesitate to ask.